Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for coming. So my name is William Callahan. I'm a software developer at Eastentire, and we're a cybersecurity firm uh, in Cambridge, Ontario, Canada. And um, today I'm going to talk to you about how we have started to utilize Spark um, in the fight against cybercrime. So I'll start off just by going into a little bit about what Eastentire does, um, today's threat landscape, and then we'll jump right into the Spark material. So a little bit about East Entire. We were founded in 2001. We're located in Cambridge, Ontario, Canada, about an hour down the road from Toronto. And we provide something which is called managed detection and response. And we do this by ingesting all the network activity that occurs on our clients' networks. And then through a combination of real-time analytics, our cybersecurity analysts that work around the clock in our security operations center, and our threat intelligence team, we can detect and block attacks on our clients' networks. So cybercrime is, is big business. There's around $70 billion each year spent on cybercrime. And there's anywhere from, let's say, $400 to $600 billion in estimated losses annually. And there are a number of reasons for this. There's easy access to cyber weaponry. So if you look when the Heartbleed vulnerability was discovered, there were a number of toolkits that surfaced and it was very easy for people to get access to these kits and exploit the vulnerabilities um, with really minimal cyber skills required. The motivation is high because the payoff is usually high. And there's really no negative repercussions because it's very hard to catch the individuals um, that are um, using these, these uh, tools and attacks. Some of the type of threat actors that we see um, we see, you know, your, your lone criminals, maybe they're part of an organized crime syndicate, um, hacktivist groups, um, insiders within an organization, uh, nation state soldiers, and even cyber terrorists. And so the majority of cyber defenses that are out there uh, protect against known threats. So these are your antivirus, your firewall, that utilize known signatures and known threat intelligence to protect against known attacks and systemic vulnerabilities. But there's a lot more out there. In order to be safe, we really need advanced behavioral analytics, anomalous signal detection to really keep ourselves safe from unknown attacks, undetected exploits, and the like. And so at East Entire, we have a human in the loop system where we keep our analysts in the loop with our analytic system, constantly giving feedback to improve the overall threat detection effectiveness. So how are we starting to use Spark? So we started off by re-architecting one of our tools called the Network Scanner. And this is a tool that's used to explore connection information from a given IP address. So given an IP address, what is the connection information? Who is this IP connecting to? What IPs? What ports are they connecting to? How many times are they connecting um, within a given amount of time. And our analysts can get a breakdown of this traffic based on IP, based on port, based on the minute of the event, or any permutation of the three. In our initial implementation, we stored everything in, a, in Cassandra tables. So based on how Cassandra is, is used, we need a table for each type of breakdown. If we're querying by IP and then by IP, by port, our clustering keys in Cassandra then become that, uh, that ordered set. So in Cassandra, we know data is modeled based on queries, not relations. There's data duplication, and denormalization is, is a way of life. So this is the initial implementation before we really started to put Spark into it. What occurs is we have these sensors that are out in the field on our clients' networks. And a sensor is basically just a collection of hardware and software which monitors the customer's network. It sniffs the traffic. It can take preliminary actions, whether it's blocking traffic based on a given company or a set of IPs or any type of signature. And in the end, it sends all the information back to eCentire. It goes through an enricher where we just add additional information to the event JSON blobs and then goes on to a Spark streaming process. This Spark streaming process, the network scan uh, counter, 
just takes account of the number of connections for every host IP within a given site and a given company in every minute on the minute. It updates these counters in Cassandra, and then when they reach above a certain threshold, it'll send an alert to our network scan processor. Our network scan processor will perform all these different rollups and, and breakdowns of network traffic and store them in Cassandra. An analyst can then click on the alert, and we read the, the information from the Cassandra tables back to the analyst. However, there's some drawbacks to this initial implementation, which led us to look into new solutions. We have over 1,000 sensors in the field, and some of these sensors are sending back over 100,000 events per hour. So the scalability of having a Cassandra table for each method of traffic breakdown comes into question. And we're limited to the use cases or the tables that are created at the time. So our goal was to reduce data duplication and load and dependency on Cassandra and build something where we were able to perform flexible queries over large data sets with minimal latency. So we don't just want to be restricted now based on those, those permutations of IP, port, and minute, but we want to be able to query across any of the fields within our events. We want to be able to query across host IPs at the site level and even at the company level. So our solution started off where when an, an alert is generated for a given company site host within a given hour window, we'll load the partitions from Cassandra into Spark. So we created a wide row event table which stores all our incoming events. And the partition key is the company and the event bucket, where the event bucket is basically the minute of which the event occurred. And this is so we can easily uh, partition the events around the cluster. And then we restrict by something which is called a receive time, uh, which is basically when the event received by the analytics system. And this is just used for auditing purposes. We would perform the query in memory and then return the result. However, there's an overhead to starting up Spark applications, and there's an overhead to reading these partitions in from Cassandra. So some of the overheads in starting Spark applications, there's the creation of the Spark context. There's whether you're connecting to Cassandra or any other sources. You're acquiring your executors and distributing the application code to the workers. Uh, a couple of years ago, Uyala created this open source project called the Spark Job Server which its goal is to provide a persistent connection to Spark, relieving this overhead. So the setup is done once, and then it's done. The Spark context is created by the Spark job server and not the job itself, and so multiple jobs can share the same context. They created an HTTP API, which allows you to easily pass in arguments or data to a Spark application and run the Spark application. We also created our own API on top of that that allowed our security analysts to easily submit queries and retrieve results. And so now we could submit successive Spark SQL queries without the overhead of starting up the Spark application. This is just an example here of how to get started with the Spark job server. Um, there's sort of two methods that you have to implement. This is a data validation step. And then you have the run job step here. So this would mostly include everything that would be in your existing Spark script. And what's nice is it comes with this job data type, which contains any of the arguments that you passed in um, through the HTTP API. So it's very easy to access. So right now, as I said, we have this system where we're loading the data in from Cassandra. We're running a query. We're returning it. But what if we want to make different queries on the same data set? We shouldn't have to load that data in every, every time. right? We can obviously cache it. What's nice about the Spark job server is that we can cache RDDs and data frames in memory. And then any available Spark application that is running on the job server can then access these RDDs and data frames uh, by a given ID. So whenever we, an analyst submits a query, it starts off a Spark job, and we can have multiple analysts now making queries on the same data frame. And we just had our naming scheme as, as the company, the start, the end time, and the, and the receive time. So now we're caching data at the company-wide level. 
within that given time frame, allowing our analysts to make those flexible queries. However, we found that managing a large number of these data sets within the Spark job server can be tedious because they had to be managed within a Spark application itself. Uh, if you wanted to cache it, you, you call the update method. And then if you want to get rid of it, you have to call the forget method. And all of this has to occur within the Spark application. So we were looking for something a little more flexible. In doing so, we came across Alexio, which is an in-memory distributed file system. So it's similar to HDFS, but you're caching in memory. It contains a file system API that supports frameworks such as Spark and MapReduce. And so if you've used the HDFS file system API before, you'll really have no problem getting up and running with the Alexio file system API. Uh, we store our data now in Parquet files, and we can use Spark to query those Parquet files in Alexio. What's really nice for us is that we can set a TTL on the data frames that we cache in Alexio. So when an analyst is usually done working with the data set after a couple minutes, we don't have to manually expire those, those data frames that are cached. We can set the TTL and have it done automatically. Um, it comes with fault tolerance mode for high availability. You can have a multi-master setup if need be. And you can promote your, your data sets to external storage, such as HDFS or S3. So this is just an example of within a Spark job server job how you would get up and running with Alexio. So we define our file system master there, where that IP could be any IP within the Alexio cluster. And your Alexio masters are defined within your Spark configuration, similar to uh, the HDFS file system API, um, we call a get on the file system, and then that allows us to perform subsequent file system operations. Uh, we're defining our URI where we pass in the uh, file that we want to query, and then we can just pass that right into our query, into our uh, query string there. We use the SQL context to evaluate the query, and then we can easily store it back into Alexio. So now the architecture for this network scanner tool looks something like this. So similar to as before, we have our events coming in from the sensors. And they hit the enricher. The enricher adds that additional information. It goes to the network scanner, sorry, the network scan counter, which does that count on the number of connections that are occurring for that given host IP within a minute on the minute. When this reaches a threshold, which is defined by the company policy, uh, we send an alert via Kafka to our new network scan processor, which makes a request to the events API to load those partitions. So the events API is just the wrapper that we made around the Spark job server in order to uh, allow our analysts to more easily make queries. Spark server then starts our Spark application, which extracts the partitions from Cassandra, and then saves them into Alexio. We then publish an alert, which gets written to a database. And our um, dashboard within our security operations center pulls this database for new alerts. An analyst will see this alert, and then they can start making queries on the data. So they request traffic breakdown. It hits what's called the network scan API. This is just an API we created that contains a number of common uh, endpoints for common queries that they would make, but they can also submit their own flexible queries now directly to our events API. This then sends a request to the Spark job server, which kicks off a Spark job to evaluate that query on the file stored in Alexio. Our network scan API then pulls the job server for the, for the um, status of the job and returns the results to the analyst when it's done. So the time that it takes um, from when an analyst starts a query to when they receive the results is just around one to two seconds. And this can be querying um, anywhere from over 100,000 rows. We've, we've tested this with even like 250,000 rows of, of information. 
And in, so in doing so, by incorporating Spark and Alexio, uh, we've expanded the capabilities of our network scanner tool to support these flexible queries with response times of one to two seconds. So now we've our, allowed our analysts not to, um, to query just not based on the host IP, but they can now query across various different IPs at the level of a company site or even at the company level as a whole within a given time frame. And so now they have a more powerful tool for exploratory analysis of this network activity. Thank you. Questions for William? So for your use of Spark Job Server, and I understand that that will spin up Spark containers and keep them up persistently. Um, do you ever run into problems where you have a lot of Spark containers using resources that might otherwise be used for other things, but because it's persistent that it just holds on to that? Or how do you have a way of, of managing that so that it's more flexible in its utilization of resources within your cluster? Mm -hmm. So right now, it's just static. The way we have it is, right, because they're persistent, they're consuming the same amount of resources. We're, we're looking into a way that we can um, make it a little more flexible. Thank you. Any more questions? No? No takers? OK, well, thank you very much. Please show your appreciation for William. Thank you.